Okay, maybe let's get started. I will anyway take a few minutes for the uh, introduction. Thank you all for joining. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have you in our migration seminar series. Um, my name is Soha Youssef, and I'm convening this seminar series on behalf of UNU Merit and Maastricht University in the Netherlands. The migration seminar series invites researchers, practitioners, policymakers, and others to discuss their work related to migration. Before I will introduce today's speaker, there's some housekeeping that I'd like uh, to introduce you to. So our speaker's talk uh, will last for approximately 40 minutes, after which we will have 20 minutes for dis uh, discussion, uh, discussions and questions from the uh, audience. I'd like to ask you to please keep your questions until after our speaker is done with their presentation. Uh, with her presentation, and you can uh, then either put the question in the chat, uh, so then I can read it out loud for you, or you can use the raise your hand emoji uh, button uh, function on Zoom. Uh, I will then allocate turns together with uh, Yulay. Uh, please, in the meantime, keep your microphones muted. Your camera can be turned on if you would like to, but please be aware that we are recording the seminar for distribution uh, via our YouTube channel later. On our YouTube channel, you can also find uh, recordings of previous migration seminars in past years. Uh, then now let me introduce you to our speaker for today, and we're very happy to welcome Vilay Turkman, who will uh, talk to us today about democratic decline and return migration, uh, what motivates highly skilled return to autocratizing countries. Um, Gule Turkman is a sociologist and guest a researcher at Berlin Social Science Center. Her work examines how macro scale historical, cultural, and political developments uh, inform uh, questions of belonging and identity formation in multicultural societies. Her research interests stand at the intersection of politics and religion as they relate to questions of identity, migration, diversity, pluralism, and citizenship. She is the author of Under the Banner of Islam, Turks, Kurds, uh, and the Limits of Religious Unity. Uh, she has published in several academic outlets, including the Annual Review of Sociology, Qualitative Sociology, Sociological Quarterly, Nations and Nationalism, and New Diversities. Uh, you can access her published uh, work uh, also via the link uh, that's on our events page. With that said, let me uh, pass the uh, floor right away to our speaker, Gunei. Go ahead. Thanks so much, Soha. Um, and thanks a lot for the invitation uh, to Melissa and to all the others uh, who have made this possible. Um, so as um, Soha said, um, today I will be talking to you about democratic decline and return migration. And let me share my screen with you so that you you will all see my slides. Um, I will just choose presenter view here. Yeah, so um, again, thanks a lot for giving me the floor um, and for giving me the opportunity to share with you uh, my research. So um, this uh, project is a part of a broader grant proposal that I'm working on. And I have uh, just completed an article with the same title, Democratic Decline and Return Migration, What Motivates Highly Skilled Return to Autocratizing Countries. Um, and I would very much love your comments, feedbacks, questions at the end of the presentation so that I can implement them um, into the article. Um, and uh, before I go on to talk about the project itself, let me give you uh, a brief background as to where this originates from. Um, so um, in 2019, I started working on highly skilled migrants from Turkey in Germany. Um, and I looked at how they navigate the uh, established perception of and stereotypes about Turkishness in Germany. Um, and based on 15 in-depth in interviews, I wrote a piece titled, But You Don't Look Turkish, The Changing Face of Turkish Immigration to Germany. 
And uh, during these interviews, I realized that Turkey's authoritarian turn was an important point, um, an important breaking point for these uh, recently arriving migrants to Germany. Um, and uh, meanwhile, I was already working on populism and rising authoritarianism around the world. Um, and I was involved in some initiatives to support scholars at risk from Turkey who had to flee uh, the country in 2016 after the coup attempt um, and the emergency measures um, that were put in place after the coup attempt. So I ended up combining these two interests to look at the relationship between autocratization and highly skilled migration. And um, I, as I said, I've started working on a, a grant proposal and um, the main research question that is driving the proposal, the grant proposal is, how has democratic decline affected highly skilled immobility beyond exile and forced migration in the last decade? Um, and as we all know, there has been a global turn, sadly, towards autocratization in the last decade, culminating in the fact that now 72% of the world's population are living in autocracies. And this is based on the Varieties of Democracy Institute report, 2022 report. And uh, meanwhile, there has been an increase in the number of highly skilled immigrants worldwide. In, in 2015 and 2016, there were more tertiary educated foreign born migrants in OECD countries than low educated migrants, a complete reversal of the situation in early 2000s. Of course, I don't want to claim that emigration uh, is the, I don't want to claim a causal uh, link between these two. Uh, and I acknowledge that immigration is a multi-causal phenomenon and autocratization is only one of numerous immigration drivers. Um, rather, you know, I believe that the relationship between the two deserves a deeper, more nuanced inquiry. Um, okay. So uh, before going any further, a clarification about terminology. Um, I use autocratization as the opposite of democratization to refer to any move away from full democracy towards autocracy. And autocracy means here um, the weakening of executive constraints, civil and individual liberties and of political rights, the restriction of political competition and the limitation of political participation. And highly skilled migrant in this project refers to those migrants who have tertiary education degrees, university degree and above. And please note here that the term highly skilled is pretty contested as it's deemed to establish a hierarchy between skill sets by automatically labeling those who hold jobs requiring lower education as low skilled or unskilled. And notwithstanding this contestation though, um, three criteria are deployed the most in defining the highly skilled in the literature, level of education, occupation and salary. So acknowledging the complexity of the term in this project, I stick to education as the sole criterion. Um, so in the in the broader proposal, so what I will be doing now is uh, to talk about the broader grant proposal for the next five slides or so, and then I will be talking about the uh, return migrants. So bear with me while I talk about the background and the and the broader proposal. Um, so in uh, the broader uh, proposal about democratic decline and highly skilled mobility and immobility um, uh, looks at the uh, first the state of art and where the literature stands on this topic. Um, and uh, the turn towards authoritarianism and autocratization in world politics has drawn much scholarly attention in recent years. So political scientists and sociologists and social scientists in general have examined this development under many names, be it democratic backsliding, democratic breakdown, de-democratization, and what have you. And uh, similarly, highly skilled migration has been an emerging topic from brain drain to brain gain, brain retain, brain circulation. So there have been many um, concepts uh, to refer to this uh, pattern. Um, and highly skilled migrants have long been seen as the embodiment of desired, quote unquote, unproblematic temporary migration. And resultantly, scholars have mostly scrutinized highly skilled mobility in relation to economic development via a focus on the costs and benefits of highly skilled mobility for both origin countries and destination countries. 
Yet the relationship between highly skilled mobility and democratic development has received much less attention. And understanding this relationship is quite vital as research has shown that notwithstanding grassroots movements, higher levels of education lead to more advanced levels of democracy and more educated individuals display higher levels of political participation and involvement in public policy debates. Thus, it would not be wrong to claim that highly skilled citizens are essential to the development of democracy. Emigration of educated individuals diminishes the qualified human capital needed to maintain um, capable public and private sectors and strong checks and balances. Relatedly, because remittances from emigrants help decrease the motivations of those left behind in the origin country to push for political and economic reform, highly skilled immigration could delay political change and contribute to long lasting autocratization. Thinking about the regional diffusion of autocracy, the loss of highly skilled citizens of one country might also impact neighboring countries in the long run. And existing studies fail to capture the complexity of the relationship between um, autocratization and highly skilled mobility for three reasons, I argue. First, uh, highly skilled immigration, highly skilled migration is usually analyzed independently of democratic decline under the rubric of labor migration. And uh, second, the few studies which analyze the two together depict autocratization only as an emigration driver, failing to problematize why some highly skilled citizens would opt to return back to or stay in autocratizing countries. And third, as a result, they embrace the limited state-centric focus on forced migration or exile and or restrictions put on emigration by autocratizing states which uh, tends to ignore the agency of the migrants. So valuable such an approach is, it only provides an incomplete picture of the relationship between autocratization and immobility. Um, as underlined by the aspirations capabilities framework, migration requires the combination of both the aspiration and the capability to leave. While autocratization is indeed an important emigration driver, not every highly skilled citizen who has the necessary resources, documents, connections, and capabilities, and who is worried about autocratization, leaves autocratizing countries, some opt to stay. Moreover, not everyone who leaves autocratizing countries emigrate for good, some opt to return. To understand the motivations behind these decisions, in this project, I will look at the voluntary migration pat patterns of highly skilled citizens in Turkey, one of the top most autocratizing countries worldwide in the last decade. To bring in a more comprehensive and holistic approach, I propose to look at four different groups. Again, this is uh, the broader proposal. Um, and uh, this is uh, two sub projects um, overarching four groups of migrants and non-migrants. So subproject one looks at drivers of emigration in autocratizing countries and focuses on those who leave emigrants and then those who return and leave again. So these are people who leave their origin country to go abroad and then come back and leave again. So second time emigrants, I call them. And subproject two looks at drivers of stay and return in autocratizing countries. And this subproject focuses on those who stay, stayers, and those who return, returners. And uh, what I will be sharing with you today is the returners subleg of this uh, of this overall proposal. Um, and in the previous version of this proposal, there were three other countries I wanted to look at. In addition to Turkey, there were uh, Poland, Hungary, and Serbia. Um, however, in this version, I needed to narrow down the project, um, hence I'm uh, going to be talking only about Turkey. Um, and cutting across both of these sub-projects will also be an attempt to problematize the voluntary forced migration dichotomy. And uh, based on the pilot interviews with highly skilled emigrants from and returners to Turkey, I've coined reluctant migration as a novel concept to denote those who move voluntarily in that there is no imminent threat to their well-being, but unwillingly in that they would have preferred to not migrate had conditions in the country been different. So the project will test whether reluctant migration can be generalized to refer to certain forms of highly skilled mobility in other autocratizing countries. 
and with such a shift in uh, focus from evolution to desire, it will contribute to the ongoing debates on how to label those who stand in the blurry middle of the forced voluntary spectrum. So uh, to give you an idea as to where this concept originated from, let me quote a return migrant who, after spending several years in Germany, decided to move back to Germany, uh, to Turkey. And uh, he said, had conditions been different, I would have stayed in my country. Why would I go somewhere else? Being a constant foreigner is difficult. Being a migrant from Turkey in Germany is doubly difficult. I would have not even considered migrating had Turkey had Turkey not taken the turn it did after 2013. And another quote by an immigrant who currently lives in Germany, I did everything I could to avoid emigrating. In the end, I migrated for my kids as I realized that I would not be able to give them the life I had in Turkey. I went to public schools, studied at a good public university, had a well-paying job. Such a life is no longer possible there. Public schools are full of pro-government teachers preaching conservative ideology. Private schools are very expensive. Even with a university degree, finding a good job is quite difficult. And here is a book that came out in 2021 by Evrim Kuran, a journalist from Turkey. It's titled, They Migrated From Here, The New Migration Generation of Turkey. Kuran and her team interviewed uh, 3,253 immigrants from Turkey in 118 countries. And 42% of the migrants they interviewed said they would consider returning back to Turkey in the future. And to the question of what needs to change for you to move back to Turkey, the most frequent answer they gave was political situation. And uh, Kuran in the talk, uh, in the uh, book talks about the voluntary forced migration dichotomy and suggests that what this new generation of immigrants is experiencing can be called forced voluntary migration. And this is what kind of um, pushed me to think about how can we go beyond the forced voluntary dichotomy. Um, okay, so now that I've given you some background information about the broader research proposal, let me turn to the voluntary return migration, which is today's topic. Um, so in this sub-project, I'm interested in understanding the following puzzle. If democratic decline acts as an important emigration driver and democratic governance is an important immigration driver, what motivates voluntary highly skilled return migration to autocratizing countries? Why would highly skilled migrants with high economic, cultural, social capital that make them desired candidates in the global race for talent decide to return back to their autocratizing countries, even if they are worried about the political path the country has taken? If some immigrants are deemed to be voting with their feet, using immigration as a form of protest, to what extent are returners politically motivated, if at all, is the uh, are the rain, main research questions behind this project. So to answer these questions, I conducted 41 in-depth semi-structured open-ended interviews with highly skilled Turkish citizens who were born, raised and educated in Turkey. So this is important. They are not uh, return migrants who were uh, born abroad. Uh, they were born, raised and educated in Turkey and who after living abroad for at least <clears throat> two years, and the median here was six years, uh, voluntarily moved back to Turkey after 2016, when Turkey's autocratization reached its peak. The interviews took place between June 2020 and October 2021 and lasted an hour in average. I paid attention to include only highly skilled citizens who returned back from countries which fare better in democracy scores than Turkey and who are not supporters of the incumbent regime because um, this way then I could rule out the possibility of returning to a desirable environment on their part. Uh, most interviews were conducted on Zoom because this was during COVID. And uh, 21 of the interviews are academics and the remaining 20 comprise white color professionals, journalists, and an ex-diplomat. And you also see the uh, gender and age distribution of the um, interviewees here. So before I go on to findings, a few words about case selection and why I'm focusing on Turkey. So as you see here, according to VDEM's 2021 report, uh, Turkey is among the top three countries that have autocratized the most over the last 10 years. 
while it was an electoral democracy in 2010, it became an electoral autocracy by 2020. And uh, this is the data from the Turkish Statistical Office, which shows the number of Turkish citizens who emigrated. Uh, and th th this is the data between uh, uh, for the years 2016 to 2022. Unfortunately, uh, the data uh, before uh, 2016 is not available online. So uh, it would have been actually better to have that data to compare um, this pattern. But when you look at uh, 2016 to 2018, that period between uh, 2016 and 2018, you can see that uh, number of Turkish citizens who emigrated almost doubled um, and then decreased in 2019. And the number peaked again in 2021 and, to, uh, and in uh, 2022. Um, as I said, uh, there is no uh, data uh, to compare uh, like pre-2016. However, uh, we have other data that could be of help in understanding uh, how the pattern changed. So this here, for example, shows the <clears throat> increase in the number of Turkish citizens who are given blue cards, which is a resident and work permit given to highly skilled migrants in EU countries. And this is blue card holder Turkish citizens in Germany. Uh, as you can see, there's a sharp increase in this number after 2016. This data comes from Eurostat. And uh, similarly, this table here shows the number of medical doctors who apply to Turkish Doctors Association to get their registration documents to apply for jobs abroad. And this table also shows an increase after 2016. And another data point comes from Gallup, which looks at migration intentions. Um, so Gallup um, conducted interviews in 152 countries between 2015 and 2017, and they looked at the um, migration intentions. So what they did is to look at the potential net gains and losses to a country's adult population by subtracting those who would like to move out of a country from those who would like to move into a country, and they call it the potential net migration index. They also have a potential net brain gain index. And according to their results, Turkey is uh, uh, Turkey has negative um, results for both categories. So Turkey would experience a population loss of 9% if everyone with the intention to migrate would migrate. And it would also experience an exodus of highly skilled residents. So um, existing studies on Turkey usually highlight brain drain as a result of increasing autocratization in the country, which is true. However, uh, the question of why these emigrants would want to return back to Turkey, especially at a time when autocratization has reached its peak, has surprisingly been left in the dark. While there are several studies on return migration to Turkey, they usually uh, do not distinguish between the return of recent immigrants and that of established diaspora members. So uh, first generation migrants and their foreign born children. And the works which focus specifically on the return migration of highly skilled Turkish citizens, on the other hand, either look at return intentions or analyze return independently of autocratization. So what did I find? Um, after analyzing the interview data in detail, I've classified the motives for return in two categories. First is affective factors. And uh, affective factors include pull factors such as yearning for family and friends and communication in one's native tongue, as well as push factors abroad, such as ethnic discrimination or loneliness. And um, the second uh, main category was socioeconomic factors, uh, especially for like white color professionals who return back <clears throat> from EU countries. Um, they uh, said that they experienced declassing and downward social mobility abroad. For the upper middle or upper class immigrants in my sample, returning doesn't translate into a significant decrease in their quality of life as it does in that of working or middle-class immigrants. So let me now exemplify these two categories via interview quotes. The first quote comes from Hassan, and note that all given names have been changed to ensure anonymity. 
a white collar professional who lived abroad for five years in Germany. Uh, he lived in Germany and returned back in 2017. So he said, people were quite boring and strict in Germany. They didn't talk if they didn't need to. Everything was orderly. The system worked well. Yet it was like eating broccoli because it's healthy, but it lacks the taste that you like. Plus, I really missed speaking in Turkish. I think that longing has overcome quality of life for me in the end. Onur, an academic who lived in the United States for four years and returned back in 2020, put it this way. People think of the United States as heaven. Before I went there, I also thought so, but I soon realized that it's not. This is what I tell people when I ask me why I returned. I tell them that it's much easier to be in a country where you can speak your native tongue. Moreover, I have healthcare literacy here in Turkey, for example. I know how to navigate the health system. I completely lack that knowledge in the US. The same goes for intercity travel. Some things are just easier when you're a native. In addition to effective reasons that act as pull factors, there are also effective reasons that act as push factors abroad, such as ethnic discrimination. For example, Didem, an artist who lived abroad in France for nine years and returned back to Turkey in 2018, said, when I think about why I couldn't get a permanent position in France, I realized it's because I'm Turkish and I used to live in the city which is located in a very nationalist region of France. Over almost 10 years, I only befriended five people there. How is that even possible? I'm such an out outgoing and social person and have lots of friends in Turkey. Also, I was working on a project with immigrants in France, and I saw the racist face of that country, how it treats its immigrants. And it's worthwhile noting here that Didem was not necessarily turning a blind eye to racism in Turkey while criticizing racism in France. She was critical of both during our conversation. Um, and another recurring theme that emerged from the interviews was loneliness. Ria, an oppositional journalist who lived in the United Kingdom for three years and returned back in 2020, underlined loneliness along with the lack of spontaneity as an important push factor. I felt so lonely in the UK that I was experiencing pandemic loneliness even before the pandemic started. For example, when my partner went on a business trip, I was alone with my baby for two weeks and no one knocked on our door. They texted me to ask whether we are doing fine, but no one came to check on us to see if we need anything. Plus, the lack of spontaneity was really difficult for me to get used to. You have to plan everything, even a short meeting over coffee, way in advance. While some returners highlighted emotional and affective factors, some others drew attention to the importance of socioeconomic status and class. Bora, an academic who lived abroad for 12 years and returned back in 2018, put it this way. The decision to stay or leave is of course personal, but also has to do with class. In Canada, we were renting a house. We didn't even have a washing machine in that house. Here in Istanbul, we own a house, a very spacious, beautiful house in one of the central neighborhoods. When we emigrated, we experienced downward social mobility, whereas for lower class people, emigration means an upward shift in their class status. The same idea was voiced by Mete, a white color professional who returned back in 2019 after living abroad for 11 years. In the United States, a US citizen who had the same qualifications as me would earn 30% more than I did. That left me no choice but lead a middle class life there. Those who ask me why I came back to Turkey are usually people who come from a more modest background than mine. There is more they can earn by emigrating. Or let's put it this way, there is more they can lose by staying here. That's not valid in my case. Similarly, Mine, a white color professional who lived in Canada for two years and returned in 2019, highlighted how comfortable life is in Turkey for her. Many people in Turkey see Canada as the country of dreams. I wouldn't want to undermine the welfare state and the rights in Canada. Yet, Turkey is also a fantastic country if you're able to create your comfort zone. In fact, I believe that my quality of life in Turkey is better than it was in Canada. And Handan, an academic who returned in 2018 after 11 years abroad, sums the situation up in the following words. Before returning to Turkey, I told people like me, and by this she means more like secular, Western-looking people, are no longer allowed to live as they like. 
I realized I was wrong. The country has just become completely neoliberalized, where anyone with enough money can live as they like. It's basically a neoliberal jungle at this point. So these findings are in line with the findings of the literature on return migration in general and the literature on return migration to Turkey in particular. Yet the question that still needs answering is what difference autocratization makes, if any, in these decisions? To understand the impact of autocratization on return decisions, I had asked my interviewees whether they felt concerned about the political situation in Turkey when taking the decision to return. To this question, almost all of my interviewees responded with a resounding yes. However, they all managed to come up with their own coping mechanisms. We kind of got used to the situation in the country, said Hale, a white color professional who lived in the United States for three years and returned in 2016. Even when we were in the United States, we kept following the developments in Turkey. Over time, we got used to it. Getting used to might be bad, yet I'm still hopeful. This is our country too. Why shall we feel forced to leave it? Not that we are doing much here politically, but the decision to stay itself is a way of resistance, I believe. Hakan, an academic turned white collar professional who lived in Europe for 12 years and decided to return because he wanted to be close to family, said that he closed all his social media accounts before returning to Turkey, as he was worried that he might be detained at the airport. When I asked how he's coping with the political situation now that he lives in Turkey, he said that he keeps to his small circle of family and friends and often resorts to self-censorship. When I talk in public, I employ a discourse in line with the official ideology. For example, yesterday in the grocery store, we had a chit chat with the owner, which ended up in politics, and I refrained from voicing out my ideas. I didn't openly endorse his opinion, but I didn't challenge him either. Some interviewers highlighted apoliticism as a defense mechanism. Serhat, an academic who returned back to Turkey in 2019 after 13 years abroad said, I don't resort to self-censorship much. I'm not a political person after all. When I asked him whether he was worried about the political situation in Turkey, he shrugged. Well, 2016 was a bit scary, but things gradually got, got calmer in the following years. Plus, our collective memory, including my own memory, is not that strong. My parents' generation also saw much political turbulence, numerous coup d'etats, etc. I guess we have to somehow accept this instability as a given and focus on the future instead. As these quotes demonstrate, normalizing political turbulence, toning down one's criticisms, staying in one's own bubble, self-censorship, or becoming or staying apolitical in the face of autocratization are the most commonly employed coping mechanisms among my interviewees. However, in the case of some academics who are vocal critics of the incumbent regime, the decision to return was taken not only despite, but also because of autocratization in that they felt the urge to move back to Turkey to bring about change, as well as to provide support and solidarity to those who are fighting for change in the country. For example, when I asked Aylin, an academic who moved back to Turkey in 2015 after 12 years in the United States about whether the political situation in Turkey affected her decision to return, she said, I did not feel uneasy about the political situation in the country. Rather, I did come back with the intention of diving into politics, not to cause trouble for myself, but not to look, but to not look at the developments from afar, to protest together with friends and acquaintances. Of course, back then street protests were still possible. Imprisonments were not as widespread. But even then, especially after the 2015 elections, a lot of people were trying to emigrate. The moment I stepped off the plane, I felt like those movie characters who go one direction while everyone else is rushing the opposite direction. Semi, an academic who lived abroad for 10 years and returned back in 2016, conquered. He said, my urge to return back was triggered initially by the Gezi uprising in 2013. As I came back several times for field research after Gezi, that urge got stronger. When you work on social movements, and when you make connections with locals, you feel like you can bring more change here than abroad. For me personally, the decision to return was the worst decision at the time as I'm one of the signatories of the Academics for Peace petition and I expected the worst. And the first two years after my return were indeed terrible, increasing detainments, imprisonments, 
However, when you are around friends, even these terrible events and tensions become much more bearable. You console each other, you calm down each other. When you're abroad, not only you are much better, but you are you also feel an ethical burden on your shoulders. When you're in Turkey, yes, there is a palpable danger of being persecuted, yet the possibility to make a difference here outweighs both the danger at home and the guilt abroad. And John, an academic who lived abroad for 10 years and returned in 2018, echoed these feelings. He said, there was an investigation on me, yet I still came back as I had never seized missing Turkey. The moment the plane landed, I was so overwhelmed with longing that I started crying. I also felt like I was in a surreal dream where I needed to fight giants. Rather than an academic coming back to teach students and convey my knowledge to next generations, I felt like someone who was invited to a battleground. I never felt scared for myself. The worst they could do is to imprison me. Yet, I felt scared for my family members. And uh, the last quote I will be sharing with you today comes from another academic, uh, Arda, who lived abroad for more than 15 years and uh, returned back to the country to contribute to the fight, as he puts it. So for me, the biggest motivating factor was the impact I have on students. The amount of the contribution I can make here with only one unit effort is West. The negative situation in this country is everlasting. I have friends who signed the peace petition. I know what they went through. They lost their jobs, their passports were revoked. And just a quick note here, this is the Academics for Peace petition, which was signed uh, by more than a thousand academics in 2016 to protest um, state indiscriminate um, state violence in Kurdish majority uh, cities in southeastern and eastern Anatolia. And uh, many academics uh, lost their jobs after signing uh, this petition and um, some were imprisoned and there were court cases against uh, these academics. Um, and, but then the constitutional court ruled that this petition was in the limits of freedom of expression. So then all those court cases um, kind of became invalid. However, there are still numerous academics who couldn't go back to their posts. And um, so this is what he's referring to. Um, so uh, I came back taking that risk. Seeing those events unfold from a distance disturbed my conscience. Now that I'm back, I feel almost relieved. That feeling of bad things are happening to people I love and I'm not there to support them is gone. For example, in the face of what's happening at Boazji University, I think to myself, if there is some pain to be shared, I'm here to share it with them. This is not to say that I would stay in this country no matter what happens. However, for now, even with everything that's happening, I'm still happy to have returned. So um, to theorize this last group of returners, I make use of Albert Hirschman's framework of exit voice and loyalty. And for those who don't know about this framework, um, in his 1970 manuscript, Exit, Voice and Loyalty, Albert Hirschman proposed that in response to deterioration in organizations, which he defines as families, political parties, nations, and so forth, members usually show two main responses, exit to leave and opt for the services and benefits provided by another organization, and voice to complain or protest in the hopes of recuperating the deteriorating conditions which interact with a third factor, namely loyalty. In a country that's undergoing autocratization, one can choose to exit, emigrate, or stay and voice out their criticism. Scholars have so far focused on exit in the form of exile and forced migration or voluntary emigration. And while Hirschman originally proposed an inverse relationship between exit and voice, he later reframed his framework when analyzing the link between migration and protest in the German Democratic Republic, where exit and voice worked in tandem and reinforced each other, achieving jointly the collapse of the regime. So in the same way, scholars have also focused on diaspora mobilizations to shed light on voice after exit. So they said, uh, people do not have to necessarily stay in their origin countries to uh, voice out their protests. They could also uh, voice out their criticisms after exiting. And maybe it's even better for them because then they would be in a, a safer environment. 
So uh, with this article and with these findings, I uh, would like to contribute to this literature by conceptualizing voluntary return migration as voice, a new analytical lens to approach migration flows in autocratizing settings. And in doing so, I also help advance Hirschman's complication of the relationship between exit voice and loyalty. While Hirschman initially argued that loyalty could delay exit in the face of deterioration, he later revised this proposition to suggest that those who are unburdened by loyalty will be prone to exit, while the loyalists will resort to voice. My findings demonstrate that loyalty in the form of belonging, not to the state, but to one's country and people, does play an important factor in motivating some migrants to return and contribute to voice. So uh, in concluding, let me uh, note that there are some caveats to keep in mind. Uh, first, most of my respondents come from Sunni Turkish families. And despite the fact that most are not practicing Muslims or Turkish nationalists, and most would not even find these identities salient, it would not be wrong to claim that their positionality as members of the ethno-religious majority in Turkey make it easier for them to return. Another caveat is that I completed interviewing in August 2021 before Turkey's currency collapsed, sprawling the country into the worst economic crisis in the last two decades. Um, I suspect that my findings would have differed and I would have needed to revise maybe the socioeconomic reasons section if I had conducted the interviews after the currency crash. And third, although my respondents are categorized as returners for the purposes of this study, considering that highly skilled migration usually displays a circular pattern, there is no guarantee that they will stay in Turkey or will not move abroad again. Um, last but not least, um, some um, you know future studies could shed light on the impact of academic precarity on highly skilled return migration decisions. So while some of my academic interviews mentioned that returning provided them with a higher social status, um, they still some of them considered return as a failure since they were not able to secure a tenure track position abroad or, or, or a permanent contract in academia abroad. So these caveats aside, um, the findings demonstrate that reasons for return can only be adequately captured through a holistic synthesis of macro level structural factors such as class discrimination, political transformation with micro level personal motives such as social ties, identity and emotions. More importantly, uh, the findings display that autocratization, usually considered to be an emigration driver, can paradoxically act as a motivating factor for some highly skilled emigrants, especially academics, who feel the urge to return to fight with autocratization. And um, I think, again, for, for future uh, research, um, a suggestion for future research could be that they could focus on other autocratizing countries to come up with a comparative analysis of highly skilled voluntary return migration to autocratizing contexts, which could provide us with more generalizable findings. Thank you so much for listening to me, and I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you so much, Vinay. This was indeed super fascinating and interesting to hear. Um, I'm always a very big fan of uh, return migration and the aspiration of uh, migrants. But I'll stop here, maybe open also the floor for questions, comments. Um, so yeah, feel free to use the raise the hand uh, button or drop your question in the mail uh, in the chat box. I see a question from Julia. Julia, go ahead. Yes, hi. Uh, thank you so much for this presentation. It was really interesting. Um, this is not really a question. It's more of a comment or a reflection. Um, so um, you mentioned one of your um, interviewees that was talking about how uh, lower skilled um, emigrants uh, probably have more to lose if they would return to Turkey. And I think this is also uh, in line with the um, aspiration capabilities um, framework, uh, because I think I don't think it was the only the the same one. But another interview is I was talking about how um, it was now a sort of uh, liberalist jungle or something mm -hmm. like that mm -hmm. in Turkey. Yeah. 
so uh, yeah, I was just thinking that maybe um, lower skilled migrants uh, that return to Turkey, um, in that case, they have, of course, lower capabilities uh, because of their social position and their, you know, economic position. And uh, yeah, just that it would be interesting to look also at the uh, lower skilled and how uh, their aspirations are, you know, uh, framed and uh, if they have different perceptions on return and also political, uh, yeah, autocratization in general. And I don't know if you have any insights about this, but yeah. Thank you so much. Um, no, I mean, I haven't, I haven't uh, interviewed any uh, myself. Um, so I, I agree that it would be a very nice comparison, though, um, just to see, you know, how <clears throat> different factors matter uh, for different groups. Um, and um, I know, like some studies, uh, which look at return migration from um uh, from europe like uh, uh turkish migrants living in europe returning back to turkey um who are mostly uh working class uh migrants but then there are other factors um, involved there because this was like the time they um uh, emigrated uh was in the 70s or um 60s like which was a time a very different time than uh, the current um authoritarian turn um, so it would not be, you know, easy to compare um, their motivations. Um, but but I agree with you. Yes, I think it would be a nice uh, comparison if someone could do that. Uh, maybe if someone could complete that leg of the study, then I could um, and we could compare with my results and see, you know. Uh, but yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Selim, uh, I see you. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. So first of all, thank you for the presentation. While actually like my question is going to be about the um, the profile of the interviewees. So I'm curious because like while you were presenting the um, uh, the codes, what I noticed like the, some of the interviews actually stay abroad more than 10 years. Some of them leave for a couple of years, then they decide to go back to Turkey. So in this regard, I'm curious whether you have whether you ask them like the, how many of them actually have naturalized. If so, did it actually play a role in uh, shaping their basically return migration aspirations uh, in the context of the Turkey? Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, that's a very good and important point. Um, yes, I asked them about this because I believe it makes a big difference. Um, and um, only three among my interviews had dual citizenship. And the remaining had uh, permanent residencies or working like work visas, work permits. Um, but none of them returned um, because they lost their residency or because they had to or because their visa was expiring they all had like legal permit to stay in the countries that they were in um but as i said only three had dual citizenship and i asked them whether you know having a dual citizenship does it matter for them because it provides them with an exit option right so like they could return and if they don't like it they could go back um they said no that uh, you know, like that, it didn't really matter. Um, but it mattered for their life. You know, uh, when they were staying abroad, uh, they said they could have stayed maybe shorter, but then they stayed longer just to get the citizenship and the <laughs> return. Which again shows that I think they still keep it as a, a you know plan B in their mind if uh, things don't work in Turkey, um, and they could. You no, know, like go back to the second country, but uh, but only three out of forty-one. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I see a question from Pinat. Please go ahead. 
Thank you very much for this amazing uh, presentation. It was very interesting for me to listen a presentation about high skilled migrants, which I'm also working on this topic. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and uh, I was wondering, as far as I realized, like most of the respondents were either from, uh, they used to live uh, in Western European countries or North America. So uh, I, I was wondering if you had chance to talk with the people, uh, Turkish citizens, high skilled Turkish citizens living in Central Europe or Eastern Europe to see if there is different patterns uh, about their decision making uh, on return because the cultural differences I think matter a lot uh, on return decisions so I was wondering if you had ch any chance to observe uh, mm -hmm. such things because I saw in some quotes that a loneliness or social interactions uh, somehow it was the push factor for them so I was wondering if there is anything that you could observe during the interviews. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks a lot. This is another very important point, I think. Um, so there were, um, as you said, um, most of my uh, participants were from either Western uh, European countries or uh, Northern American countries. Um, there were, I think, like three or four uh, from um, Central or Eastern European uh, Central and Eastern European, sorry, um, countries. Um, I didn't really spot um, that big of a difference uh, between um, these two groups. But then again, um, three, three or four is not like a big subgroup. So, um, but I think it would have been nice to actually, um, like now that like retrospectively, when I look back, uh, on my uh, participant selection, it would have been actually nice to maybe just stick to two or three countries and then um, just look at like uh, th two or three countries, like host countries, uh, destination countries, um, and then um, come up with a more um, structural comparison of the uh, factors uh, like these type of push factors that uh, come up in these um, destination countries. Um, but what I notice right now, for example, in um, like I, I can come up with a comparison of like Western Europe versus uh, Northern, uh, uh, Northern American countries, um, but not necessarily um, like Western versus Eastern Europe. Uh, uh, but I totally agree with you that uh, the culture is uh, pretty different and I think it's like a, um, closer to uh, what maybe um, one could uh, um, experience in Turkey, like a bit more like ex emphasis on commonality uh, rather than individuality uh, is what one can see in Eastern European countries. Um, so it might have been different. Um, in terms of like, you know, social encounters for those um, immigrants in those countries. Um, but unfortunately, I can't make that comparison, at least not at a, you know, like a structural, uh, nice level. Thank you. <laughs> Any more questions or comments? Just trying to go through the screens. Okay, I do not see any comments in the chat box or any more um, hands raised. So with that, thank you so much to all the participants for making it here. And thank you uh, very much, Bile, for this very fascinating uh, work. Keep up your great work. And it was very nice and also emotional for me to hear all of the calls. It was very, very beautiful. So thank you so much for sharing it. Thanks so much for the invitation again, and uh, thanks to to the uh, participants for listening and for engaging with the project and for the questions. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> and for those interested, uh, we are going to post a delay uh, again in uh, Feb next year, yeah, but just in uh, in a couple of months. Uh, keep an eye on our UN Numerit uh, events page, and you see everything about the upcoming events. Thank you so much again and have a lovely evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.